Welcome back to another Facebook Live broadcast. My name is Sarah King. I am the founder and owner of Invigorate Physical Therapy and Wellness here in Austin, Texas. And I'm so excited to come back to you guys today and talk with you about a topic that has come up within our private Facebook communities, the Invigorated community, um, which you're welcome to join if you'd like to join us. Um, and also inside of my private program, um, the Booster Tribe. And so I wanted to talk with you guys today about fatigue, exhaustion, and Parkinson's disease. I know that there are a lot of people out there struggling to improve their energy, kind of overcome this fatigue, and we're going to talk a little bit about five areas that you can investigate to help you um, determine where your fatigue and your um, exhaustion may be coming from so that you can upgrade those areas and get some energy and vigor back into your life and your day. So again, if we haven't met yet, my name is Sarah King. I have a doctorate in physical therapy, um, and I also am really passionate about helping those diagnosed with Parkinson's create a individualized Parkinson's plan around their diagnosis based off their goals, their, um, their specific life, and just what they want to achieve while they're here. And so if you are in Austin, um, I may have seen you as a client, but if you are um, not in Austin, welcome. We have lots of resources on the blog. And one thing that I did want to say was, um, first of all, anything you hear in our Facebook Live broadcast is just general advice, um, really good general advice, but general advice all the same. And anything that I talk with you about, um, I want you, I want to encourage you to talk about it with your healthcare team. So making sure that you're talking about your energy and your lethargy and any exhaustion that you're having um, with your healthcare team so that you can um, tailor all of this information to your specific situation. So again, this is not specific healthcare advice. Please talk it over with your healthcare team. And we're gonna dive into a lot of topics today. Exhaustion can be a really comprehensive and complex topic. And so we're gonna dive into the five areas to investigate. And it may seem like a lot of information coming at you at once. So I wanna encourage you to take notes if you can. You can always rewatch this video later. It'll be on YouTube, Facebook, it'll be everywhere for you. Um, but also, I created a free ebook that I've been giving away for a long time. It's called Building a Foundation. Um, and it is getting the most out of your Parkinson's treatment program. So we're going to cover some of those topics in our talk here today. But if you can go to my website and sign up for that free ebook, it'll come to you in PDF form. And you'll also get weekly emails from me coaching you through how to upgrade these certain areas of your life so that you can feel better, move better, and really just live the best life that you possibly can. So you should see the link either above or below or maybe even next to this video, depending on when you're watching it. But I highly encourage you to go over there, download the ebook. It's completely free, no strings attached. Um, so enjoy that. That's a resource that I created because I had so many people asking me questions about these types of things um, that I wanted to make sure that they had a nice resource for it. So you can go there anytime and download that resource. Um, and then that will invite you into our private um, invigorated community which is our private Facebook group where people come from all walks of life all across the globe with one diagnosis of Parkinson's and um, support each other problem solve ask questions talk about anything under the Sun and mostly Parkinson's but um, it's a great community and so when you sign up for the ebook you'll get invited to that as well so go ahead and head over there and sign up whenever you're finished watching here um, I would love to have you in there so as you trickle into, I love saying hi to people. I can't really see who's in here watching, um, but Lauren is in here moderating for me for a little bit. So if you guys poke your heads in and want to say hi, just put your name um, and you know where you're where you're checking in from in the comment section below. I love to see where people are checking in from. I can see people are watching. I just don't know who's out there. So um, if you're ready, say hello and then let's get started. Okay, and you can give me thumbs up a big old heart, a happy face, a sad face at any time. Um, you know, I always love to know there's people out there watching. Okay, so we're gonna cover five areas to investigate. The very first area, of course, it's gonna be one of my favorites, is movement. So when you're not actively using your heart, your lungs, um, your muscles to move fluid around your body, um, if you can imagine a rushing river versus a stagnant pond. 
when you are moving and you're exercising and you're being active, your blood and your fluid and your energy is moving like a river. It's moving from one point to the other. You're getting fresh new water in, um, fresh new nutrients in your case when you're moving. Versus if you're stagnant, if you're just sitting a lot, um, you know, on the couch and not really getting anything moving, you're like that stagnant pool, um, that stagnant pond that's kind of got some muck grown up in it and, um, you know, isn't looking too fresh. That's the same with your fluids in your body. So getting up and getting moving, I always recommend getting up and trying to move first thing in the morning. Everyone's different. I understand you've got to get your medications on board. Um, you've got to get everything kind of set we're not quick movers in the morning. I definitely understand. There's a reason why I don't see my clients until about 10 a.m. most days. It's because it's hard to get started. But if you can do a little bit of stretching first thing when you wake up in the morning to get some blood flowing, that'll perk your energy system up just a little bit to help you overcome that hump. And um, not to overplug the free ebook, but I did put some exercises in there that you can use in the morning first thing that are very gentle that'll help get your blood flowing. Um, but you can do gentle stretches that maybe you've gotten from your therapist or a trainer or that you've connected with in the past. Try those first thing in the morning to get your energy going, kind of kickstart your circadian rhythm into play, and then see how you feel the rest of the day. So, and also I want to encourage you, movement doesn't have to be all 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, you know, with when you have a Parkinson's diagnosis, you should be trying to aim for 30 minutes a day, 20 to 30 minutes if you can. But you can start with 10 minutes. You know, if you're new to exercise or if you're really feeling lethargic or exhausted, tie those shoes up, get moving, try 10 minutes of exercise. Set your phone and say, I don't have to enjoy this 10 minutes. I can hate it all the way through, but I've got to get to 10 minutes. And if I get to 10 minutes and I'm still exhausted and I still don't want to continue, Sarah said that I could stop. You can blame it on me. So try and make it to 10 minutes. If you're feeling good, see if you can go five more, then five more and add it on slowly, but don't put all this pressure on yourself to work out for 30, 45 minutes. If you're really, really exhausted, start with 10 and see how you feel. Okay, before we move on to number two, let me say hi to people. I just can't not say hi when you're in here. Okay, Brenda from Utah. Welcome, Brenda. I, um, Utah's on my list of places that I wanna go. So much beauty out there. Um, Mary Burns from Cleveland, Ohio, of course, In Motion. I got to give a, a plug to uh, In Motion, which is out there in Cleveland, Ohio. There are Parkinson's uh, Community Center out there. Love Cleveland. Um, Lori from Wild Peach, Texas. Always checking in. Love to see you, Lori. Nora's in here from Ontario. Never misses alive. Love you, Nora. Good to see you. Judy is from Virginia Tech, I suppose. Hi, Judy. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Yeah, say hi. I love to see you guys out there. Tyler. Hi, Tyler in Cibolo, Texas. Yay. Sharon. Welcome back, Sharon from Myrtle Beach, of course. Um, good to see you. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while, Sharon. Okay. So on to number two. So our second area that you can investigate if you're having a lot of fatigue, a lot of exhaustion is the area of sleep. I know that seems really obvious, but I want to kind of make this very specific to Parkinson's and what I see and what I've um, heard from my community. So I know there's like, I think there are studies said that 88% of people who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's struggle with sleep, whether it's struggle with falling asleep or struggle with staying asleep or struggle with um, sleeping too much during the day. Um, there are a lot of symptoms inside the sleep realm that can really kind of make us go around in circles. And so I want to dive a little bit deeper into the sleep talk um, so that we can really kind of pick out what is what may be going on. So the first part of making sure that you are sleeping well is to optimize your sleep routine. It's not to say, oh, I'm not sleeping well, so I'm gonna go on and find a sleeping medication. I'm gonna get on my Xanax, my Ambien. Um, those can be very helpful. I'm not an anti-medicine in any capacity, but I think that they should be supplements to a healthy routine instead of trying to make up for an unhealthy routine. So don't just throw sleeping medications onto a really bad sleep routine. Um, because sleep quality and disease progression are really closely linked. And if you're just taking an Ambien or a Xanax, you may not actually be getting the quality of sleep that you really need. And so 
optimizing your sleep routine. I'm gonna give you a few tips here, but I also wrote a two-part sleep series um, over on the blog. But when you optimize your sleep routine, the most important part is to make sure that you have a consistent bedtime and a consistent wake time. I know that not all of you, but some of you may be already retired, so you're not on someone else's schedule anymore. And it's hard to um, you know, motivate yourself to get up at a certain time and go to bed at a certain time sometimes when you don't have someone else planning your day. So if you can choose a time at night that you are getting sleepy, you know, um, there's this analogy of the sleep train. The sleep train comes and you can hear it coming because you start to maybe feel a little tired, your eyes start to close, and some of us will hop on the sleep train and go to bed, which is what you should do, and some of us will say, oh, I'm kind of sleepy, but I'm going to turn on that um, you know, T HGTV series for a couple episodes. For me, it's Game of Thrones. Um, but I know we may be a little bit different in our TV watching habits. So some of us, you know, we missed the slip, sleep train. It came, it said hello, it's, it passed by, and you were like, nope, I'm going to watch HTTV, thanks, instead until 2.30 in the morning. And then I'm going to take a Xanax, and then I'm going to see Sarah at 10 a.m. That doesn't work. Um, not that that's a specific shout-out to someone that, that happened to today. But, you know... Figuring out when your sleep train comes and deciding that that's maybe going to be your bedtime. And then your wake time typically should be around the time that the sun comes up since that's the natural circadian rhythm that you're going to follow. But pick a sleep time, pick a wake time, and stick to it for 30 days. Try and be consistent, plan everything else around it. Sleep time, wake time, consistent for 30 days. Another great thing to do is to start to reduce the amount of blue light exposure you have during the day and right before bed. So blue light is really commonly coming from phones, from computers, from television. Um, it's a certain wavelength that interferes with um, your ability to produce uh, melatonin, um, which helps you, or serotonin. Now that I say that, I'm not sure, but um, it's the, the hormone that induces your sleep cycle. Blue light blocks that. And so if you can get a blue light blocker on your computer, on your phone, there are even blue light blocking glasses. Mine aren't up here. I would show you mine that you can slip on as soon as the sun goes down to help you start to filter out the blue light that really shouldn't be coming into your eyes after dark um, is really helpful. And I'm going to give you a resource to find a pair of those pretty soon. And then also if you're able to journal or somehow clear your mind of some of the anxious thoughts that may be going through your head. There's um, mindfulness-based stress reduction that can help you recenter with your body and calm your mind in order to help you induce sleep. But getting those anxious thoughts off your mind can also be really helpful. So I'm gonna have Lauren in the comment section below. I'm gonna have her put two links. The first link is to a blog post um, that is all about optimizing your sleep routine. I dive really deep into that. And then the second post is about products that could potentially help you sleep. So um, a couple that I really love in there is magnesium at night that can help not only with cramps, but it can help um, deepen your sleep and help induce sleep. And um, there's another brainwave app, and that actually is music that can help get your brain in sync with the um, brain waves that it needs to dive deep into sleep. So those are a few that are on that list. And I, if you are struggling with sleep and you think that this is an area you want to investigate, um, go ahead and dive into those resources and start to implement those things immediately. And I do want to say we have five areas, but just pick one that seems to resonate. You're going to hear one of these areas and go, I think that might be what's causing my problem and start there. Work through that for a little while and then go on to the next area. It's a process and to do everything at once is really, really difficult. So pick out one area, try some new techniques out for maybe 30 days a month and um, circle back and see how your sleep is doing. Okay, let's see. Bonnie's checking in before we go on to sleep disorders. Bonnie's checking in. Good to see you. Good to see you, Bonnie. Thank you for coming back. Okay, so if you are having trouble sleeping and you optimize your routine and you're really consistent but you're still having trouble sleeping, I want to bring to your attention three different sleep disorders that are pretty common in Parkinson's so that you can talk to your physician about getting checked to see if there are any specific techniques for you that um, you can use for these different things. So sleep disorders, um, I want to say, can contribute to excessive daytime sleepiness. 
So if you're finding yourself really groggy throughout the whole day, uh, maybe taking multiple naps during the day, and you have a regular exercise routine, but you're still just really, really tired overall, just over um, kind of an overwhelming, excessive sleepiness during the day, then you may need to be checked out for a sleep disorder. And there are three that I wanna talk about. One is insomnia, which can is, um, is either difficulty falling asleep or difficulty staying asleep. And then we have something called REM sleep disorder, which is R-E-M sleep disorder. You may have heard of this. This is when your body doesn't completely paralyze itself as you're sleeping, and so you end up acting out your dreams physically. So you'll know this because your partner will tell you that you punched them in the side multiple times last night and you were having a dream about, you know, robbing a bank or something along those lines. Or maybe you uh, sleepwalk quite a bit, or maybe you try and get out of bed at night and you're not awake. Um, that can be a symptom of um, a REM sleep disorder that you can get tested for to see if that's something that is affecting you. And then sleep apnea, which is essentially not getting enough. Um, it has to do with the amount of oxygen that you're getting at night. Maybe you're not breathing correctly um, or you know, there's a lot of different things that could be going on with sleep apnea. So insomnia, REM sleep disorder and sleep apnea are three areas that you may need to get tested for. And you're, you can mention it to your physician. You know, he's sleepwalking at night. He's really, you know, he's punching me in the side at night. Um, I can't fall asleep or I fall asleep for a few hours and then I'm up and I can't stay asleep. Those are important uh, symptoms to talk to your physician about. They may not have to do with your typical Parkinson's symptoms, like your tremor and your slowness of movement, but um, they can go hand in hand with Parkinson's. So take that information. If it applies to you, talk to your healthcare team about it um, because they can help you strategize on different ways to improve that sleep quality. Okay, we're going on to number three. You guys doing okay? Thanks for putting that link up, Lauren. All right, so number three is the third area that you can investigate if you're having trouble with fatigue or exhaustion is your blood pressure. And I will say this is something that goes overlooked quite often. It's something that um, myself and other physical therapists, it's one of our pet peeves. Um, and if you are not tracking your blood pressure and you are chronically fatigued and exhausted, you may be missing a really big piece of the puzzle. So there are a few different kind of medical jargon words we're gonna jump into with blood pressure. One of them is orthostatic hypotension, and it's abbreviated OH. Um, and that's a sudden drop in your blood pressure when you're changing positions. So you're going from laying down to sitting up and you get woozy. You're going from sitting down to standing up and you feel woozy or really um, dizzy or you potentially could pass out. Maybe you feel really heavy in the legs, really um, exhausted all of a sudden. That could be from a significant drop in your blood pressure, which is also not uncommon with um, a diagnosis of Parkinson's just by the fact that it affects your um, organs and your autonomic system differently. So if you have a history of falls, maybe when you go right when you get out of bed in the morning, you go from sitting to standing and you start walking and you feel dizzy and woozy and you fall down, that could be orthostatic hypotension. Another area that people may not recognize that they are having some blood pressure fluctuations is after a meal. So when you eat, all your blood rushes to your stomach and goes away from your external organ or your external or your extremities, it goes all to your stomach. And so that can actually cause a significant drop in your blood pressure as well. So if you feel like some of those may be your issue or you know that you are struggling with uh, orthostatic hypotension, this is a really big key. Talk to your physician about it because you're likely on some type of hypertensive, um, you know, if you've had high blood pressure and now you're on a blood pressure medication, that can de definitely affect your blood pressure. But you should consider slowly changing your position, so not going from sitting to standing too quickly or um, laying down to sitting up too quickly. You can also make sure that you're staying hydrated, which we're going to touch on here in a little bit. Um, and you can also try wearing compression stockings or even garments. They have they have compression garments that'll go around your midsection as well to help you regulate your blood pressure. So if you notice that you're, you're staying hydrated, you're not moving as quickly out of a position, and you're maybe wearing some compression stockings and your energy is improving, 
then you may have some issues with um, circulation, but those techniques may work really, really well for you. And the thing that um, I want to mention as well is when you have really low blood pressure over a long period of time, so not, um, you know, not just a sudden drop in blood pressure and then it regulates again, but low, low blood pressure for a long period of time. Maybe you know, oh yeah, my blood pressure is just really, really low all the time. What can happen there is your, your heart um, and your vessels aren't pushing blood out into your organs um, as well as it should be. It's called hypoperfusion, which doesn't really matter to you, but essentially your organs, including your brain, is getting less circulation. So it can leave you feeling exhausted, tired, um, lethargic, really just drained um, when your brain isn't getting enough um, circulation. It's called hypoperfusion. And so if you have chronically low blood pressure, then um, you know we need to be, and by we I see your team needs to be exploring ways to keep your blood pressure up a little bit more. And one of those techniques that I encourage to every client, Parkinson's or not, Every person watching this um, should be staying hydrated. So if you have, if you're dehydrated, you don't have as much volume in your blood. It's not as thick, um, or it's not. I shouldn't say thick. Um, you don't have as much volume of blood. So it's like um, just a lot less blood being circulated. I'm going around in circles. So when you hydrate yourself, you're getting enough. Um, blood volume to raise your blood pressure and have it be at a safe and healthy level so that it can perfuse your brain and your organs in a way that you need to feel energized. So I did write an article on um, hydration and Lauren can put it below, but if um, you are having trouble staying hydrated or if you feel like you drink so much water and then you just go to the bathroom every 30 minutes, every 45 minutes, I have an answer for you. It's over on that blog post. Um, because if you have to go to the bathroom every 45 minutes when you're staying hydrated, then you're not hydrating properly. So I'm going to walk you through how to stay hydrated on that blog post. Go check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, it's something that I recommend. Number one, no matter what your issue is, if you're not hydrated, then you can't, you can't tackle that problem. So, okay, we're doing good. We're flying through these. We're about to head on to number four. If you're doing good, just give me a thumbs up. Um, and if you are watching and you haven't checked in yet, just say hi in the comment section below. I'd love to hear where you're at, where you're from. Um, we're talking about five areas that you can explore to see if you can improve your fatigue and your exhaustion. Um, so welcome if you're joining us late. I'm Sarah King. Oh, got lots of thumbs up. Okay. The fourth area that you can explore is your nutrition. So I'm sure if you're watching this and we have any history together, you probably know how much I love to talk about nutrition and brain health and um, energy. So I actually, you know, I want to say that when your cells aren't getting the nutrients that they need in order to um, function properly, then you can't possibly have any energy whatsoever. Imagine you're driving your car, you pull up and your gas tank is empty and you know, you drive a Honda Accord like I do. And so instead of putting in the normal gas, you put in diesel fuel and you fill it up and you shut that tank and you start driving. Your car is not going to function for very long on the wrong fuel. And when you're eating poorly and you're not hydrating, then your cells are doing the same thing. They're saying, I want to function well, but you're feeding me all the wrong stuff and I can't function this way. So if you fill up on diesel and you drive that car long enough, you're really going to do some damage. So I actually did a four part video series that some of you may have already watched when it comes to nutrition. It's at www.invigoratept.com slash gut health. And so it is way too complex of a topic to dive into deeply here. So I want to direct you over there. If you think nutrition is the area that you want to explore, um, please go sign up. You get a free workbook, free four videos so that you can, um, you can explore that at your own pace. But um, in summary, you should be filling up on foods that are high in um, nutrients and minerals and those are typically things that you can grow in nature. So you may have heard of the Mediterranean diet where you've got lots of fruits and vegetables, um, nuts, seeds, um, wild fish, 
lots of olive oil and healthy fats. That's a good place to start and you really want to avoid that gunk. You want to avoid that diesel fuel going in your gas tank. Um, so gunk, foods that gunk you up like diesel gas does, um, sugar in all of its forms, processed foods, fried foods, um, unhealthy oils, those are all things that you should be staying away from. They're going to gunk you up. And you know, trying to eat red meat in smaller portions if you're going to have red meat. And then dairy is definitely in the research not looking great for Parkinson's as well. So a lot of people ask me, okay, so my nutrition, I need to work on that. What supplements can I take? And you can just give me a thumbs up if you'd love to just take supplements and be able to eat your Ben and Jerry's because I know I would. I would be giving myself a thumbs up for that one. Um, but you can't supplement away a poor diet. So if you're eating really well and you're getting all of your um, vegetable servings in and healthy fats and then you still feel like you have some holes in your program, that's when it's time to supplement. And I explore supplements in my um, the free video series that I mentioned, the gut health series. And there are some other ones to explore, but um, we're gonna stay away from that at the moment just because it's a deep dive into nutrition. And I do wanna give a shout out to Lori Mishley, who's at the Seattle Integrative Medicine Clinic. She does a whole talk online, it's called Food for Thought. Um, and she talks about supplements there as well. So there are plenty of ways to get lots of healthy nutrients, and I bet if you switched your nutrition around, you gave up sugar for a little while, um, you gave up the processed junk food, and you see you kind of figured out how you felt after, excuse me, four weeks, eight weeks. Oftentimes, it takes a little bit of time to get that energy boost back. Excuse me. Um, I bet you would feel a lot better. So I'm really passionate about nutrition. I think it's really, really, really important and the future of Parkinson's treatment, um, but we'll hop off that today. So we're on to number five, the fifth area that you can explore if you're having a lot of fatigue and exhaustion. Before I hop into that, I saw some people said hi, so I just wanna acknowledge you. Colleen from Hudson, Quebec. I haven't been there yet, it's on my list. Marissa from Denver, welcome back Marissa. Dawn's here from Fort Lauderdale. So good to see you guys. So good to see you guys. Mark and Beth in Michigan. Welcome back, Mark. Good to see you. Um, we've got Kristen in Vegas. Very good to see you. Danny Martinez in Minnesota. Welcome back, Danny. Yeah, we've got some new faces and some familiar faces in here. I love that. Love that. Okay. So we're on to the fifth and final area to investigate if you're having issues with fatigue and exhaustion. And this is not a suggestion. This is something that you need to explore at some point or, the other, or another. If you start with it, um, that's great. If you don't start with it, please come back to this area. And it's the area of social health. So I wanna ask you, you know, how often are you connecting with others? And unplanned from me giving this talk, I saw a TED talk that I may share on our page, what makes a good life? And Really, all the research suggests that the people that are connecting with others in a meaningful way that feel like they have a support system around them that they believe in and that they trust and that they've developed that deep connection with, they are the healthiest and they are the ones that are living the longest and really say that they have a fulfilling, happy life. So loneliness and isolation um, can creep in on you and before you know it, you haven't seen your friends or um, anyone for that matter for a long time. So I want to encourage you to connect with others because this feeling of fatigue and exhaustion may actually be apathy or depression um, just being interpreted a different way. Um, depression is definitely a taboo topic and I want to bring it into the light because I know a lot of you feel lonely or can feel lonely at times um, and sad. And so connecting with others, you know, is one of the most important things that you can possibly do to re-energize not just your physical body, but your soul and your mental well-being. So I do want to explore apathy versus depression versus exhaustion and fatigue. So apathy by definition is a lack of interest, concern, or enthusiasm. So you're just very apathetic towards doing anything. You're maybe not tired, but you just don't feel like doing anything. That's apathy. And um, depression is a significant feeling of the loss of hope, sadness, or low spirits. 
often paired with guilt and feelings of inadequacy and overlapping with a lack of energy and a disturbance of appetite or sleep. So if those sound familiar, guys, then um, we need to be really having this discussion around um, mental health and mental well-being. So finding a tribe that you can be a part of, you are welcome to be a part of my tribe if you're not. Um, the Invigorated Community is a free Facebook community. You're more than welcome to join. Um, but it's a nutrient. It's not a coping mechanism. You know, seeing other people actually fills your soul in a way that's healthy that you need. So find time to meet up with anyone. It doesn't have to be anyone diagnosed with Parkinson's. It can be friends, family members, church friends. Um, just reach out because the, the chances that they are lacking that connection is pretty high as well. So go for a walk, grab coffee, um, you know, go to a church, um, you know, uh, mass or whatever you observe. Um, keep a weekly lunch date going. Um, keep, sorry, I just had a little message on my phone. Um, keep a weekly lunch date with a small group of friends. Keep it small so you can be intimate and actually talk to each other instead of getting lost in the noise because I know sometimes our voices can't be heard over a lot of noise. So um, I also want to encourage you to get out of the house. So leaving your house to actually go see people is really important. Sometimes that energy of the house can feel very daunting and very heavy. And so um, even if it takes extra time, it's worth doing and being consistent. So it's very normal to feel sad after a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And I don't want to hit on it too much because I know it can be really heavy. But if you're having those feelings, oftentimes we don't talk with anyone about processing that diagnosis. Some of you have, we all do it in different ways, but finding someone who can help you process those feelings is really important instead of holding them all inside. That can feel heavy and that can feel fatiguing and exhausting. So I encourage you to use that as part of your um, Parkinson's plan, finding people um, with Parkinson's and without Parkinson's to connect with and to share your day with. Just like you're sharing your day with me today, I'm so grateful for it. I wish it could be face-to-face. -face. That would be wonderful. Um, one day it will be. So um, I also want to just ask you, now that we've gone through the five, so we've got movement, we've got sleep, blood pressure, nutrition, and social health. Those are five areas that you're investigating. I would love to hear what area you're diving into first. So maybe share in the comment section below or head over to our invigorated community, our private Facebook group, and share with us what area you're gonna investigate first so that we can help um, give you more resources and support as you go along your journey. So if you thought this was beneficial, I just want to say thank you for showing up. It's always a pleasure to serve you guys. And if you found it beneficial, please share it with at least one other person that you find that may find benefit in it. And I would also just want to close with saying I encourage you to download the ebook. Um, it's got eight steps in there that are very similar to what we talked about today that you can go through at your own pace, explore, build up your Parkinson's plan, and then you'll get emails from me walking you through all those eight steps as well. So I appreciate you all. I hope that you know that, and I am rooting for, me, for you from the sidelines. Um, so keep me updated, and until next time, sending you lots of big hugs, and keep moving as always. All right, bye guys.